I'd like to welcome everybody to the CCW Safe Podcast. I'm Rob High here in Oklahoma. Uh, we're today at, down at 50 Farms. And we're joined today with our uh, very special guest, JJ Mercaza. JJ, so happy that you could join us today, brother. Rob, thanks for having me, man. It's an honor to be here and sit here and be welcome to the farm. Um, you know, JJ is a world-class shooter, but uh, our favorite thing is he's a brand ambassador for CCWSA. So he came into town. Um, I don't know that we're going to let him leave. We've been dealing with temperatures from 105 to 110 for, it seems like, nonstop. And JJ blows into town, and we're in the 80s. So... <laughs> um, for those of you who really don't know much about JJ, um, I'd really like for you to kind of get off on your story a little bit, where you sure. came from, how you got to where you're at right now. So That's a crazy story. I uh, I'm an immigrant from the Philippines, right? I, I was born and raised there. Started shooting when I was 1988 out of necessity. Um, I was, my dad was a doctor at the time, surgeon, and and there was some sort of incident that happened in the house when he came back home at around five o'clock in the morning, six in the morning from the surgery. He, um, he realized there was, hey, all the kids just hid in the bathroom or in the master bedroom while everyone else was, the house was in shambles and a couple of people and all that stuff. So the helpers at the time, um, even though my dad was a doctor at the time, he didn't make the money that doctors would make because the Philippines, he would sometimes get paid livestock like dogs and chickens and stuff like that. But anyway, he had a good profession, right? My mom was already here in the States at the time. She, she left um, when I was three years old in order for our transitional life from Philippines to the U.S. started to um, happen. So she needed to start the process. So she's in and out of our process. But anyway, started shooting at eight years old. My dad showed me the gun. It's like, hey, you need to learn how to shoot just in case something like this ever happens. Or you, don't, you just don't hide in the room. You can point, defend yourself and your sisters and everyone in the house. Point at that door, pull the trigger, and then do this. So... Needless to say, it's short, a long story short, um, that turned into a competition, met some guys, my dad started competing, started bringing home trophies, I got, it piqued my interest, started doing what he was doing in regards to drive fire, he was doing some draws and reload, and I started wanting to do it with him, and then little by little, I started competing as well, when I was such a young age, at about late eight years old to like early nine years old, and then by the time I was 13 years old, 1993, um, we, I had the opportunity to try out for the Philippine team, play sixth overall in the entire Philippines as a, as a, as a 13 year old, but they didn't qualify me because at the time there was no juniors program. I was, I think, one of three people that was a junior shooter at the time. And so they sent the best four or the best eight shooters, the females and the male, to I think it was London at the time, the World Championship. Nonetheless, 93, we moved here to the US, started shooting again in 99, and I haven't stopped shooting since. And, been fortunate enough to be able to represent certain companies, really back me up. One of them would be now CCW Safe. And throughout those career of, of about 30 years of shooting, I have won a few things. I've won a few world championships, won a few national titles. And it's been a, an amazing, amazing career being able to say that I've served as a, under, as a law enforcement officer, federal law enforcement officer uh, for about 10 years, and then only to do what I always have loved to do and but figured out a, how to make a living out of it. So now it's literally me waking up like I'm living the dream. Every day I wake up, I feel like I'm gonna wake up, truly wake up and the dream's gonna be over. So I continue to work hard because that motivates me. The fear of it all stopping is, is what motivates me to continue to keep going and driving as hard as I possibly can. That is so cool. So where did you guys live? We lived in the Philippines and then we lived in Jersey when we first moved here. Okay. So New Jersey was our, our initial, September 1993, was Newark, New Jersey was our entrance. Now, I, I know how crazy tight gun laws in, are in Jersey now. Are they much more difficult now or were, was it noticeable to you as a, as a young man? No, they were just as difficult back then. Okay. Um, there were different challenges now. They've increased certain things and a little bit more laws and stuff like that against guns. Um, however, here's a funny story about New Jersey. I started competing in 1999, started traveling a little bit here and there, right? And around, I believe it was just before 9-11, I think it was two, or just after 9-11. I'm not really quite sure in regards to the timeline, but I went, I went in as one of my, I think it was 2000, I went in as one of my last trips for the year. I was heading to Costa Rica to shoot a major match over there, a competition, international match. When I checked in, airlines know me because I've checked in the same airline for the entire year, for the last previous years as well. And so 
I checked in, the gate agent was like, hey, what, why are you standing here still waiting for security? I'm like, oh, they're still running security on my guns. And I don't know why it's taking them a long time. It was after 9-11 because my parents used to be able to walk me to the gate. Yeah. Now we had, there was a security before you walked into the gate. That's right. So it was well after 2002, 2003, whatever. So anyway, um, next thing I know while we're waiting here, because you're going to be late in your flight, you got to go through security. I remember seeing a, a guy in a suit and two guys, a PAPD guys in, 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 in their law enforcement uniform. And they walk up to me and say, hey, you're Simon Rukas. I said, yes, I am. Come with us. You're, being, you're under arrest. I said, for what? What did I do? I said, we'll explain to you when we get to the station. And so basically they arrested me because I was traveling or I traveled to the airport with hollow point ammunition, right? And that's competition. Hollow point's a little better. It spins faster or whatever, all the, a little bit more accurate and all that stuff. So they brought me in and I'm like, I didn't know that was illegal. Like you can buy this, these bullets in the shop. I said, don't worry about it. And then we'll figure this out, you know, and we'll get our AUSA to see and the prosecutor to see if they'll decide to prosecute you. And little short, luckily enough for me, I was in a contract at that time. That's right, so it was way after 9-11. Not way after, just shortly after. Lucky that I was in a contract already and that I started to teach and I did a demo for a bunch of group of chiefs and, and police officers and all this stuff. And one of the police officers, the chief of, of police, of, of PAPD of some sort, happened to have been there when I was doing a demo down at Lang City. So when I walked into the station, he saw me and he's like, what are you doing here? I said, oh, I'm, I, I think I'm being arrested for my bullets. And the chief of officer goes, hold on a second. He goes, no, let me, he goes, I got him, Sergeant Gonzalez. I'll never forget, Sergeant Gonzalez, I'll take care of him, walk him to the back door, and they put me in this interrogation room, not a, essentially a holding room. And they took the cuffs off, and he came, comes back, and he goes, here's the law highlighted for you. And he goes, if the AUSA decides to prosecute you, give that to your lawyer, and that's what's going to get you out. And he goes, just take care of me on the backside later on, kind of th- being funny. And he goes, but you'll be fine. Walks away an hour later, the, the U.S. was like, we don't have a case, let him go. And PAPD, PAPD and TSA were so a little bit embarrassed and I guess was a little afraid that we were going to process a lawsuit or do whatever it may be. They ended up booking me straight flight, business class, and they walked me all the way to my gate and not go through security. <laughs> now I remember that being escorted all the way through. So anyway, that's why in Jersey, there was always that rule that there was, you couldn't have high capacity mags, so I thought that was the issue. But at the time, by taking the magazine apart and the base pad and plate and all that stuff, not an assembled magazine, they weren't considered a magazine unless they were put together, they were considered parts and tools. Okay. So we were able to do that. But so we've always had these strict rules that we've always had to go by and abide by throughout these years and stuff like that. So by the time of 2005, 2006 coming around, I became a federal law enforcement officer. I never had to worry about that quite much, but I remember still traveling and seeing some of my fellow competitors and friends that travel with me, the stuff that they had to go through. That's crazy. Yeah. So I can disassemble my stuff and it's not considered. At the time it wasn't. Okay. Now apparently I think if you, even if you owned any piece that would assemble into a high capacity mag, you would essentially get charged for something. But a lot of it was more secondary uh, yeah. charges, right? Like they're not going to look at as a primary charge. It's like if you're doing something stupid, speeding or school tone, and they see that you have a high cap mag, I think there was an addition three months per jail, uh, three months in jail per magazine, high capacity magazine that you had. And I had eight, so I can only imagine. <laughs> it's 24 months. <laughs> um, so you mentioned being in federal law enforcement. What is, is that kind of what started you on that path? How did you, because you worked for the Marshal Service? Yeah, I, was at work for, I worked for the Federal Air Marshal, actually. Okay. And it's funny because I still feel weird saying Federal Air Marshal because for a long time it was hush hush. Yeah. No one needed to know who you needed. We had we all had cover stories. We had prepared our cover stories to say who what we did. And so I I just vaguely said DHS because DHS umbrella a whole bunch of different agencies. And so I said, yeah, DHS employee, I was a federal agent there. And that's it. And so what really started it all was 2000, right after 9-11, I'd won a match and I barely lost the US Open Nationals. And I came back and Mike Seekliner gave me an opportunity. He's like, what are you doing now? I said, well, uh, the computer company that I was working for, Lucent Technology at the time, it's no longer around. And I'm trying to just figure out a way to make money, go back into the computer industry. And I was working in the hospital at the time, doing some sort of troubleshooting, networking, and all that stuff. And um, as an IT guy, basically, for doctors. And he was like, hey, what do you think about teaching? Can you teach? And I'm like, my head going, I've never taught in my life. But I said, this is an opportunity for me. So I, yes, I have taught before. So Mike's like, all right, let me introduce you to a couple folks, and they'll do an interview. And then from there, you might make this much money. 
So I said, okay, sounds good. Good money in, in the industry and something. Like, sounds good. I'll do that. Went for an interview, went to a trailer park and signed a bunch of paperwork. Um, I remember them freaking out because I was only a, a, as a green resident alien at the time. I wasn't a U.S. citizen yet. And they said they couldn't give me a top secret clearance. And I can, or the highest clearance they can give me is a secret clearance. So that means in this building, it was a top secret facility. I needed to be escorted everywhere. And they didn't know how that was going to work and this and that. And I couldn't see certain paperwork. But anyway, um, I remember walking out of this, the, the trailer and they said, is um, $350 for a half day, $650, $625 full day rate. Is that good with you? And I'm thinking $3.25, $6. I'm like, I don't understand. I'm like, oh, shit. I said, man, that's kind of low. But I'm like, Okay, I guess I'll take it. I love this job. I'll do it for free. You guys are giving me housing. Totally cool. Got my first pay paycheck. I realized what it was. It was $625 per day. Domestic contract. And that's when I realized, like, holy cow. And that was my first immersion training military, getting in the world of federal agencies and watching how they operated. And it was uh, for a while there as this Asian descent, Filipino, there was a little bit of a stigma becoming a law enforcement officer because in the Philippines, it was one of those things that had, if you were successful in, as a law enforcement officer or as a politician, you either got paid or there's some sort of crooked things going on. Right. It's kind of sad, but that was like right. the truth, right? Everyone kind of got bought. So I, I was hesitant in jumping in. Every, year after year, they'd go, man, you'd, you'd be awesome. Jump in now while you're still young. I'm like, no, I'm making this much money. I like this contract. But young and naive, not understanding that eventually the contract will dry out and I'd have to find a real job. Yeah. But that was the first initial time where my dad started realizing that my hobby is now bringing in more money than my real job. And so he started to understand like, okay, maybe there's something to this as long as you can keep this going. But eventually once it started running out around 2004, 2005, Dynacore, Triple Canopy, they were recruiting other people to go deploy. And I remember uh, my rate just went up to 900. I was tier three or whatever it was. And some of my guys that were Rangers and SF guys were getting the big money, $1,200, $1,500. And I was getting 900 plus per diem. And I'm like, Dad, I'm making 900 now. He's like, you're not going. And my dad and my mom put a stop to that. So I didn't deploy and my, my buddies went. And so I stayed back and I had to figure out something else. And one of the things I, saw, I remember was working with a specific agency had a lot of special forces guys that came in, locked in dude that I truly enjoyed working with. And I said, that's something I like because it's plain clothes. I can only act when I need to act and I yeah. don't want to be seen and stuff like that. And that was, that's how it started. Crazy. There's so many things in my story, but it's the weirdest thing in the world to that's a great story. have lived this long and short at the same time. Yeah, that's a great story. <laughs> um, yeah, the whole the whole post 9/11 thing. I had, uh, you know, I was already in law enforcement. I was traveling just outside Chicago for a a big uh, defensive tactics instructor course. You were actually traveling, um, and I was so oh, yeah, and Lord, and all of a sudden 9/11 happens, yeah. and I know. And you know, remember they just they grounded everything, they yeah. shut down yeah. domestic travel, they just didn't let anything move. And then uh, two days before I was supposed to fly out from my school, they opened it back up, which was a huge bonus for me because yes. I sure didn't want to make that yes. drive. Yes. But it was a an invitation only uh, wow. instruction. So uh, big deal. Yeah, chief. Uh, he was he was a SEAL team guy. Uh, Lewis Hicks put the thing on. But was it was he a development group, part of the development group. Guy? Yeah. Okay. And he yeah, and I he did that, that for uh, the Department of Justice. And back then, uh, they had under the the Clinton administration, they had started a thing called Police Corps. A wonderful, wonderful training program that that uh, gave really elevated training to their instructor corps. Um, and it was something that took place only on college campuses. Holy smokes. Uh, Oklahoma had one of them. Um, <clears throat> and here it was down in Ada, and it was ran by uh, Oklahoma Highway Patrol. They're the, they were the cadre of instructors down there. But you could come in and, and redirect your coursework to law enforcement and get this criminal justice degree. And at the conclusion of your education, and it was it was a four year degree. Jeez. Um, at the at the end of that, you were guaranteed a job with with a guaranteed uh, entry level salary, um, and you had to you had to whatever agency hired you had to pay for half of it, and the government paid for your other half of your wow. salary. 
the only requirement was you had to stay for five years and you in that five years you had to work in a patrol capacity you couldn't you know branch out and be a detective or promote or do anything like that until your five years was up but at the conclusion of that five years your student debt was completely canceled. Holy smokes. So it was a it was a phenomenal program. Was police corps designed for morally for state and city local or it wasn't a for federal local. program, it, wasn't it? It it was it was a federal program that was designed to bolster and give greater training to a lot of these little wow. small agencies. Um, That's you know, you so can get cool. Tulsa or Oklahoma City sure. and they kind of get the the cream of the crop that, right. that's available in the state or OHP, you know, the guys that want to be state troopers. Um, but outside of that, those smaller agencies are, are really scratching to, to get the best wow, that's so qualified cool. people they could. And this program really, really gave them huh. that. I, you know, it's just one what of those things. What happens to the program? It's just done? It's like training, dude. It's that, you know, especially at, at, the, at the municipal level yeah. that yeah. Those are the things that get that cut first. Quick, you know, yes. do, you, do you want to have training or do you want to have another body to help? That's so right. That's why we get so emotionally involved when, when they start talking about the defund police and yes. do this and do that. Yes. Um, and you know, it's funny you bring that up, right? I, I, was, in a training, I was in a training department. For more, um, some part, part of my career was I was a field agent, but then I, was, I got brought in as a GBA ground-based assignment in a training department. And whatever happened out there, they always came back to training. Right. Hey, what, why do they do this? Is this what part of your training? They looked at it, whatever. And if anything happened, it's like, all right, we don't need this. We don't need it. They don't need to shoot 200 rounds a month. They don't need to shoot. Let's cut that down in budget. It was always training. So now people always say defund the police. I always took it to heart because I was like, man, I was there struggling, trying to make do with whatever 50 rounds they gave us. And for, watching the effects of when you do defund. 100%. You see um, the turnover. The, the whole culture changes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, you know, there's such a good balance that, that has to be struck. Um, the best, you know, I ran the police academy for Oklahoma City for nine years. The best groups I had had a really good mix where, they, where you'd have like a third of your guys come in from blue collar and then a third of the ones that are coming in are coming in like straight from college. And those are the hardest ones because yes. they've really never done anything yes. in life before. Yes, yes. And then a third of the guys coming in from uh, military backgrounds. And because you had so much diversity to work no, no, with in yeah. there that they were really strong classes, right. you know, where, where the college group of guys could help yes. with the ab academic portion. Yes, the admin stuff. Yeah, 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 the other guys would, would bring them up on the, on the physical skills yes, and things yes, like that. Yes, yes. Um, you know, the, the other things that we saw were, you know, when I was in the academy, they asked, you know, how many guys in here have, have actually been in a fight? Sure. And, you know, most of the hands go up. Now and, it's a totally different scene. Yeah, you might have 25% of the, the kids. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And, and now you put them out on the streets after training. They have and never been every yeah. single confrontation they're, they're going to be in is an armed confrontation. Yes. We know for a fact there's at least one gun yes. present. Yes. And yeah. that's you know, it's, it's hard enough to, to fight. And yeah. For those that have never fought over a gun, that's that's kind of eye opening. Fought over, over anything. Right? Anything, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know um, how you're going to react, right? And that's why it, I, had, I had recruits that, that really didn't care for me because sure. it was one of those that as we're going through, and I didn't do it to make friends. And fortunately, I had like I I got to get a whole lot of friends out of those kids I yes, trained. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I let them know on day one: you, nobody's walking out of here without me punching you in the face. I have to know how you react to that. And you know, that's kind of a mental game for them at the at the front end, because yep. all of a sudden they're you know this little guy is sitting here running his mouth like he's going to punch me in the face. And I really am. We're going to do it. Yeah, yeah we're going to find yeah, out. Yeah, but when we get to defensive tactics, we're going to spar and we're going to roll and we're going to we're going to learn. You're in my world now. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. The cool and thing about that is that in my academy, I was able to work in the academy as well. At a certain point, we were able to convince the upper management because there was such a turnaround. Where how many of you guys have ever been in a physical fight mm. for whatever reason, whether you were drunk for whatever, you were just protecting yourself, whatever maybe, and the hands started getting less and less, and the, the experience behind it. So the reasoning, the articulation we went with was we can't let them go out there and their first fight is 
saving someone else's life because we were working yes. on planes and, and fighting these terrorists that are hardened and been all they've done is completely been desynthesized. So we, we had a part in our physical defensive tactics training with uh, with tactic, uh, with uh, mission training and stuff like that where they're going to get nailed hard and we see how would they react with a, a shock knife, uh, an instructor going pouncing on you and stuff like that. And you saw some really interesting stuff. Yeah. Some people relished on it and some people shocked you. Good way and bad way, right? Mm -hmm. You're like, this guy would do good. Boom. And you're like, how did that happen? How did you stop? And sometimes like this person's going to completely run down, completely overwhelmed, and that person fought like hell. And you're like, where did that come from? Yes. You can't judge a book by its cover. But Ever. Yes, never. Ever. I, yeah, I, that's what I realized. I, anybody that came out and worked for me in my training cadre, that was something I, I had to get into their head, is you'd look over here and you'd go, man, JJ, that kid's a stud. And then all of a sudden you get out here and it's Different. like, oh. <laughs> um, and you want to you want to make that discovery in a training environment. You don't want to do that for real. No, yes. Um, yeah. So that was really cool. Um, but uh, I was mentioning Lou Hicks. Uh, when we had that training, he had to actually had to leave for a short time because he had to go speak to Congress because uh, they were wanting him, they, they approached him initially to set up training for air marshals. So I wow. knew I knew all about it wow. from the very inception. That's crazy. Um, but it, and brutal course. It was 50 hours a week for five weeks. Yeah, we got, we got smoked. Yeah, yeah I, would, so, I can only imagine. Uh, but yeah, we, your, your final, final test was a fight test with his staff. The twenty-minute fight test is, it, is that the circle of death where you you sit in the middle and you either fight or once you fall on the ground it, they'll call another guy and another guy and you do for non stop. Yeah, I think they, they started integrating that later on in in some of the Fletzy training or yes. even in the specific. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah that's Lou's, Lou's the one that brought that in. You did that's your crazy. first first fifteen minutes was stand up. Yeah. So yeah. It was striking or yeah. takedowns. Your last five were going to be grappling. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I've seen people tap out off a of panic breath. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. They finally are exhausted and they yes. get laid down. 130 pound girl lays on you. All of a sudden, you can't control your breath. People are tapping out. Yes. Or passing out. Yes. You know, and it, it was like self induced essentially. It, it yeah. truly it's the craziest is. thing in the world. I've also had people go, How do you train for that? Yeah, it's. I don't know. It's mental. Yeah, I've done right it. There. I panicked the first time and I'm like, This guy's 180 pound. I can't seem to move him. And I just tapped out. But we were jiu jitsu just rolling around. Yes. And I said, What was that? And I said, Dude, just when it happens, slow it down is the first thing you need to do. And just know that you're not being choked. You're just trying to get breath in them. You're trying to panic almost essentially, right? You're trying to catch the message. Slow it down. Breathe in, breathe out, and just understand where you're at and be yeah. present. Yeah, one of the questions, and we get questions all the time from our members, um, is, is the preparation stuff. And, and for me, there's as much in the mental aspect of that preparation as there is in the throwing bullets down range. Um, you know, part of my training stuff is, is I've got a cert gun that is exact replica of my carry gun and I have an airsoft gun, same weight, same everything else, exact same weight as my carry stuff. Um, so I can do things inside my house with a, a non-functioning gun, with a, a firearm prop. It's a training aid. Um, but what are some of the things uh, that you would say, if I was going to have an opportunity to speak to our members, these are things I might do to, to build and improve that can get me there quicker than just with no pre-planned thing for, you know, just hopping out on the range and, and wasting a bunch of ammo. So uh, with that... With that question, I'm going to always use me as an example mm -hmm. and in my experiences throughout. So the biggest thing I noticed when I was going through the academy was the diff how, how big a difference it was amongst other guys that were just fresh off the gun that would go out to the range plinking versus some of the guys that would dry fire versus a guy like me who professionally dry fired for a living. Like It wasn't professional. It was just something that I did. I, I felt like I had to do. And so whenever there were tactics involved, there were scenarios, the last thing I had to think about was how to get my gun out, how to manipulate it, how to not muzzle my partner, how to move with it if it malfunctioned. I was more ingrained into observing the scenario as it was popping off. 
And the instructors always commented on how it was easy and fairly quick for a new guy like me that never did tactics to pick those things up. And what I started to notice was like, let me pay attention to who struggled. It was the guys that didn't even do any kind of training at all. And they would just say, oh, I had shot before, but not trained and whatsoever. So I started even going deeper into that. And I started to realize that if their manipulation or the ability to manipulate the gun and are comfortable with racking the slide, seeing the sights, reloading, pulling a trigger correctly, they couldn't even do the basic, basic of just manipulating the gun, look like at least the way they look like on TV or look like a competition shooter or a guy that's a special forces guy. That was the key thing that would break the mold to, or that would, that would enhance or the, highlight their inability to perform when now they're under stress. Now they're dropping the gun, they're fumbling this. Now the covert, covert draw is no longer so covert. Now they're sticking their elbows out and, and now they're throwing rounds everywhere, shooting different partners, shooting everything. So, my suggestion is, if you can dry fire, draw your gun a couple times, not even long, just focus on drawing it once or twice, whether it's a blue gun or a cert gun or a purely empty gun, mm -hmm. do a couple of reps every other day, maybe not even long, two, three minutes, just do those reps. By doing that, that movement alone, in, in a month, in a year, it's like that one degree of separation. You do one little degree of separation to yourself first for your former self or somebody else that doesn't drive fire. And you, let's just say you drive fire, you just do the draws. Not even reload. Eventually in a year, you'll have a pretty significant change in what you were to where you are now. Uh, all it is is just doing that movement. And I always say to my guys right now when I teach like advanced shooters, I said the, the route to GM, the Grandmaster in competition, that's the highest level you can achieve. The route to Grandmaster is fairly simple. There's two things. You need to learn how to look like a Grandmaster when you're shooting and moving the gun. And you need to make it sound like you're shooting like a grandmaster, meaning the gun goes bang. So manipulation, really good. Shooting, really fast. Not necessarily be accurate. If you can do those things, you're 90% of the way to becoming grandmaster because all of this has become second nature. Now pulling the trigger is also second nature, pulling it fast. Now we just need to understand and, cap and, un and break down the chaotic mess that's happening in front of us and make sure that that's no longer chaotic and that's now something that we can process. Learning how to drive at 150 miles an hour as opposed to cruising at 55 miles an hour. That's where I want to operate at. And then when you, things do happen, the scenario, real life stuff, you're not going to go at your cruise control 50 miles an hour. You're going to go as fast as you possibly can. But if you've never pushed yourself beyond how quick you can draw, how fast you can shoot, you're going to try to do it the first time on the scenario when your life depends on it or on a scenario in front of all your peers, that's gonna be a tough, tough thing. And I always also have the saying, weird things happen when you do things really fast, like driving, shooting, whatever it may be. Weird, like you draw and then all of a sudden the mags fall. That's never happened to most people before because they've never pushed themselves to that failure point. Yeah. I wanna establish and, and find out where my failure points are in training, like you said before, and not when it's finally happening. So that was always one of my biggest advantages in whatever tactic school I've ever been sent to, whatever movement school I've ever been sent to, shooting school, the shooting and the manipulation of the gun was something that I had a huge advantage over everyone. I may not be the best shooter, but I knew I could manipulate the gun better than most because of my driver. Whether it's true or not, I believe it within myself because I knew I did this more than most. Yeah, that's one of the things that I always got asked with, with like brand new shooters or recruits that had never really been exposed to, to firearms is why don't we get more time on the trigger? <clears throat> and there's so many ways I can get time on the trigger, but the big deal I need for you to, to know is, is those manipulation skills. 100%. And 100%. it worked so strong for me. I grew, up, I grew up hunting, I grew up with a shotgun, grew up with long guns. I, di I didn't shoot a pistol. I didn't know anything about shooting a pistol. All I thought was a trigger is a trigger is a trigger. <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was a rude awakening for me. And all of the things we do, so you're, you're on the line and we're gonna, this next course of fire six rounds, but it's gonna be two plus two plus two. And it was forcing those continuous reps yes. of doing the little things yes. that keep you alive yes. and, and make you win. Um, and then, you know, we start out with no time limit. And okay, now this next, this next go, we're gonna go 12 seconds. And the next go, we're gonna go eight seconds. Now we wanna pare it down to, to four. Can you do four? Special um, failure. And you, yeah, yes. and, we're, and we're putting that pressure on. Um, and it, what seemed really difficult at first at 12 seconds, oh my gosh, 12 seconds, that's too fast. 
And as you build and build and build, Correct. suddenly you're just rocking through it. You see your progress. And, yeah. and I remember the very first time I drew my firearm and it was 45 minutes into my very first shift. Jeez. And, uh, Out of the academy. Yeah. Uh, my first day in field training. And I remember it happens and we, we get there and the guy steps out on the front porch and he's got a sawed off shotgun and it's, and it's muzzled down, but he's, he, he comes out with showing with, you the, guys. with yes. the shotgun. Yes. And I just remember just pop and on target. And it wasn't until after the fact that you realize. we're going back to the car and it's like, that was fast. Yes. That was fast. You got to appreciate it. Yeah. Because <laughs> it fast. just happened. Yes. But it was, you know, we had thousands of reps doing that already. So those are the things that matter. I agree. Um, those are the things that matter. Um, so I, I have to understand what my situation is. I got to pay attention to my surroundings, those, those kind of things. But integrating all those little things I, I, it doesn't have to be time on the trigger. I agree. Um, That's the last part. Yeah. If it gets to, I want to avoid that. If I can draw my gun fast enough to stop the scenario, yes. I could stop a lot of things, right? I, but I'm not using that. But the, before that, there's layers, right? Situation awareness, um, blending in with the crowd and all that stuff, paying attention to your area, behavior detection and all that stuff. Then, But if it really comes down to it, when you have to pull your gun, you want to be quick, fast, and, and pretty damn precise. Yeah. Once it happens, it does happen. You might not even get to pull the trigger because now it's like, whoa, you, 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 got, great, you, know, you look like you know what you're doing. And, and honestly, in, in a situation like that, when it's so far to that point, um, that's actually a de-escalation. Absolutely, 100%. It's yes. absolutely a de-escalation. It's an equalizer for most, yes. yes. Um, and I don't know, I've, I've, I've done that thousands of times for real. Your career. Yes, for real. Yes, <laughs> um, yes. So it, it's one of those things that when people talk about it, you know, I think I want to get a new holster. Well, if you're going to carry that, I need you to come out of that holster as many times as you came out of the one you're putting down. Yes. You have yes. to understand that there's things that you have to become so intimately familiar with. Yes. And that's the magazine changes. It's, it's hands position. It's yes. marrying your hands together and yes. getting on target. Um, you're talking about your dry fire. Kind of, kind of give us a little rundown on how you would encourage the dry fire. Is it? Am I just getting out there and just clicking a trigger? Because there's times that I've I've learned to trigger. Sure. By just, just pulling the trigger. Just pulling the trigger. Hundred percent. Yes. So I look at it as depending on what I'm trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. More for me now, I don't really look at the subtask hyper focus drills. But yeah. in the beginning, my dad literally told me rack the slide, fill the wall. Break the shot, back the slide, feel the wall, break the shot. Learn that connection between your finger moving to the wall before you break the shot. And then he goes, and then she, he added a layer. He goes, aim in. He goes, you see a sight picture? I'm like, yeah. He goes, make sure it looks like iron sights. Make sure it looks like that. Okay, can you picture it in your head? I'm like, I can picture it. He goes, okay, do it again. Prep, watch the sights. I mean, visualize the sights, break the shot. Go to the wall, visualize. So those were hyper focus drills where I learned individual skill sets by itself. Yes. Nowadays, what I do is I, once I got past that, I would just draw my gun, go to the wall, see my sights, then react. Consciously decide that it's now to pull the trigger, not, a, not an automatic press the trigger right away as soon as I'm on target. So I do these things where I make these adjustments, but really on my dry fire, I, I, I test my draw, my ability to get on target, not necessarily pulling the trigger, because I can do that like what you said, individually by itself. Test my draw, moving, uh, moving to the target, my presentation, my index points, in different scenarios, positions, sitting down, standing up, different clothing, whatever, cover, concealment, whatever it may be. And then, then I, sometimes I'll, tech, I'll test my reload. Once in a while, I'll just sit there on days, I just want to do five minutes of dry fire. I'll just, I'll just aim the gun, reload, drop, whether I'm doing magazine exchange or, um, or a magazine retention type program or a speed reload where I'm dropping or an emergency reload where the slide is in the rear. I'll practice every single one of them depending on what I want to work on, right? But really I'm working on draws, reloads, and the ability to be able to get, get off the line and still see my sights on a draw. Right. Those are the things. And so I want to put one more thing to that. I'm a competition shooter that competes and have won a few world cha championship titles, uh, several national titles, and I'm one of the top shooters in the world, which is weird to say that, but it's, this is my point. I'm a guy that doesn't get to shoot as much as most of my competitors. I shoot about 15 to 20,000 rounds a year which is a lot for regular folks, but a guy that shoots competition for a living, guys I'm competing with are shooting 50 to 100,000. Some of them are shooting 200,000 rounds per year. 
I dry fire more than most of these guys. My dry fire is what allows me to be able to compete at such a high level, right. the 1% in the competition field, not necessarily on pulling the trigger. Dry firing is free. For a long time, I didn't have ammo sponsor. I didn't have any of that. So I just dry fired my butt off. And I, wasn't, I didn't have access to the range because I lived in New Jersey. It was an hour and a half to the range and it was only open for a few hours and Saturday for the public to go. And so it was pick and choose what we did. And sometimes the range was closed. We'd drive back three hours later, didn't do any training, live training that day. I would just dry fire and that's how I did it. So dry fire is super important. It's just your time dedicated. If you really want to be not, you don't want to be a liability out there. You want to be an asset if you have a gun. The gun is a responsibility. Carrying alone is a decision you make that you're going to do something that day to protect either yourself or your family. That is a burden as a law enforcement officer yep. yourself and me as a cons That was our job was to carry. And I remember just at certain points in time, I'm like, this is just getting a pain in the butt to actually rig up and gear and make sure that I'm not printing and all that stuff. And then at, at certain 16 hours into the shift, Little points that you didn't think about is now uncomfortable. Now certain things are numb and you're sitting there going, I, I, I don't know if I got so much more. And then to do that again the next day, the next day, the next day. Yeah. So as a concealed carry, CCW, your responsibility to carry is obviously for that, right? You're going to have to do it. It's a decision that you made. You're going to go out there, be an asset. Don't be a liability. It's good stuff, bro. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, what is uh, next up for you? Where are you headed? I'm going, I, this year's a big year. I have a, uh, four national titles that I'm going for. I have a Pan American Championship that I'm going for. And at the end of the year, cap the year off, win the World Championship. Again. The World Championship only happens once every three years, but this has been the last five years because it's been canceled. So we mm -hmm. haven't had a World Championship since 2017. Um, so 2021, very hungry to get my, get that title. Where's it at? It's gonna be in Thailand. So nice. we're traveling all over, 2,000 competitors traveling over there. The best of the best in each country is going over. I think over 90 something countries are going to represent theirs. And I I'm, have the uh, distinct opportunity to be able to represent and have been representing the Team USA in the gold team. So we've won the gold. We want to bring it back home. That is so cool. Both team and individual. That, that's, such a, that's such a neat opportunity to be able to, to do that and actually represent that flag. Um, I got goosebumps. Yes. Yeah, I've, I've had the opportunity to compete internationally yeah. and um, just you, you, rep, you represent more than you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's bigger it's, than you. It's way bigger yeah. than you. So. And there was, there, was, there was one time in 2018 where we were shooting the Southeast Pan American Asian co competition and the U.S. team was there. And I remember walking up there and the, and the team captain, not the team captain, team manager, looks at me and said, JJ, you'd be perfect for this flag to hold it. Would you want to hold it? I'm like, yeah, I don't want the flag barrier. I would love to hold it. Yeah. I remember just holding it, just kind of being funny, holding it, I'm going, this, is, this means something. Yes. As soon as they called USA, oof, I raised as high as I could. <laughs> and I remember thinking, the process of us getting here, mm -hmm. right? And that was, that's what hit me was that it took us a long time to get here. And now I'm able to represent US to the best of my ability for something that I just became good at because I wanted to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, I was like, man, I think I'm making my family proud, not only my family, my department I represent proud, the people I'm with proud of what I've done and what I can do in this country. And that was one of those things that's like, I, got, I have a responsibility to become good at what I do so I can share it and pass the knowledge on to everyone else. Because I want everyone to experience this moment. That yeah, was absolutely. an unreal moment for me. And that's why it, it really touches me because that moment in time, I still have a picture of it on my phone where I raised up like as high as I possibly could. I'm proud to be Filipino but America gave me the opportunity that I'm able to do and live the life that I live now. That so, is so cool. That's, that's why I carry the flag both ways. I got the American flag in front, I got the Philippines uh, pride front, uh, son in the back. That's very cool. <laughs> JJ, I've had the opportunity uh, through the course of my law enforcement career to train with some of the best guys in the world, some of the, especially for, for our country. Sure. Um, so I've, I've trained with really high level law enforcement guys, really high level military guys. And I know that you've had the opportunity to train those guys. Um, what would you see or say are some of the things that you've seen that kind of are points of emphasis for those guys as far as dialing them in and, and where, where they become even 
better than they were before. But you know, they're, and we're talking tier one guys, the guys that are really in the heat of battle, they're tip of the spear guys. Um, what are the things that seem to be focal points for them in their training? So, yeah, that's also an odd thing, right? Just straight up competition shooter throughout my life, and now I get hired to train the most elite of our forces and be able to, to help them out, essentially. And mm -hmm. it's a weird thing, because those are our heroes, and those are guys, and to be in that position, it, it, it's humbling, to say the least, intimidating, next, to be able to stand in front of them and go, oh, what else do you want from me? You guys have been trained by everyone else, and you guys are highly trained and skilled. Two things stand out to me. And every time I've ever trained a very high level unit, it's either, um, there's two things. They're very emotionless and they're very, they want to do right. So the first thing I want to talk about is emotions. So when we're out there doing drills and doing these things, a lot of them are very much even killed whether they're doing bad or whether they're doing good. They're not adding or subtracting to the event of the situation. When they blast the drill, they go, okay, cool. What's next? What can we learn next? And that's, they're not, they don't get excited a lot. I'm a very excitable guy, so I show a lot of excitement and emotions. And these guys just go, okay, cool, that was good. We're able to do that. What's next? They move on, move on. They want to do right. I'm brought in as a performance guy to showcase what's possible out there. What's the next best thing? When, in regards to movement, can they, can they still be better than what they are? Since they're already the best in their field, bring in a professional shooter and see what this guy does. Mine happens to be movement and some shooting high-speed marksmanship. So I'm brought in for performance size motivates them and see that there's a capability, there's a little bit more for them to learn, right? So once I'm brought in, I, sh I show them, literally it's just the efficient application of the fundamentals. And that's what I've seen they grasp toward the most, the most efficient way of applying the fundamentals, but it's still the fundamentals. They're not looking for the sexy hondo roll, running, gunning with one hand. They're looking for how to do what you can do nine out of 10 times at speed when no one else can do it. And that's what they're looking for. And it is the coolest thing to do because they will, they will rep it out a thousand times, shoot a thousand rounds in five, 10 minutes just to want to do right. They want to do it right and get it right before they walk it out there. And then these are things that I've learned within 15, 20 years of my career. Some of these guys are trying to learn it within an hour, within three hours, within that week. Mm -hmm. And it's impressive to see the difference between Monday to where they're at on Friday or depending on who I'm working with. So that's. That's always been an amazing thing. And, and you know, the higher level, more secret they are, the more progress that you see in regards to change and the more the want they want to do in regards to the fundamentals and do it right. It's the craziest. So two things. It's really the emotionless or the lack thereof and the, um, and the want to do right. Yeah. Uh, you have any takeaways for us today? No, um, really to me is that being a part of a different company and to represent with you guys, uh, CCW, allowed for me to open my eyes that I used to just, I was reliant on FLIOLA, 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 where if there's anything happened, we had chief of council that backed us up, yeah. right? And sometimes they didn't really back you up. Sometimes they were like, hey, you jacked up, you're on your own, get your own. Uh, and then I remember someone I had to deal with that in my field, I said, that'd never be me. Right? What's there, what are the chances? And the chances are nowadays, the, 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 the culture, the environment, whatever it may be, it's kind of getting hot and heavy out there. And if, if you're a concealed carry, carry, you have a responsibility not only to protect yourself, your family, and if, even if you do happen to protect yourself, you have to protect yourself outside of the gun, beyond the gun. And that's what CCW brings in. And that's from what you guys have done out there to be able to be the only company to bring from murder to acquittal. That's no one, that's, that's such a big thing to be able to experience that and to show that the member that you guys protected and defended only paid his annual membership fee, and didn't pay any more extra, and stuff, which is pretty neat, right? And you guys are experts, yeah. you guys have offered so much more. So yeah, that's, that's one big takeaway that I wanna bring up. A lot of people don't talk about that and it's just, I think that, that I'm proud to be able to be part of this company and I'm proud to be able to be one of the ambassadors and whatever I can do to be able to promote, promote it to the best of my ability, I will. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, we welcome you back next week also. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can message me directly at rob at ccwsafe.com. Um, anything else you can think of? That's it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you. We'll see you next time.